once they had written the actual constitution and the delegates had voted on it and it was proposed officially to the states, uh, it wasn't over. They still had to ratify it. And according to Article 7, I believe it was Article 7, um, of the constitution, that is the article that details how uh, an amendment is passed. And they use that same ratification process for the constitution. Um, so what they're going to do is basically submit the constitution to each state legislature. And if you forgot what a state legislature was, that was the... Uh, body of uh, representatives for each state uh, that made state laws uh, acting as their legislature. And uh, they had to essentially uh, debate about it, vote, and either approve it or not. Uh, and three quarters of the states, uh, which um, the fraction for the uh, uh, U.S. at the time, uh, while well, it's not exactly 75%, but getting over that 75% required nine out of 13 states to ratify the Constitution. So that became the issue. Uh, and that's going to occur in uh, September is when they complete it, and then October, uh, people really get into, um, have a good idea about which states are going to pass it, or pass it quickly, ratify it rather quickly, and which ones are going to be a bit more uh, obstinate about it. So, uh, ratification. Um, so it's going to be officially proposed, the Constitution, uh, and written uh, in September of 1787. And what's going to happen again is the... Uh, still required uh, ratification. So that ratification process is going to take a few months uh, to accomplish. You, you do, of course, have the, the, the constraints of the 18th century as far as like travel time. Um, they have to, of course, make copies of this thing and, and distribute it to uh, the various state legislatures. And then they have to get together and read it and argue about it. And then they have to, you know, submit their uh, opinion or not their, their decision on whether it's being ratified or not. Uh, so that's a timely, time consuming process. But it's going to be delayed uh, due to some objections by um, uh, some former opponents of the U.S. Constitution. So uh, ratification, uh, as according to the Constitution, I believe it's Article 7, don't quote me, but I think it's Article 7. Uh, ratification uh, required a three-quarters uh, vote by state legislatures, or three-quarters of the state legislatures to uh, uh, approve it, required three-quarters state legislature. And at the time, with the 13 states, that was 9 out of 13. So the issue becomes, this is crap, it's going dead. The issue becomes which states are going to oppose it, potentially. Uh, and the, the biggest form of, or, or group, if you could call it a group, because they had some uh, disparate opinions, but they sort of generally aligned on a few common themes, uh, came from the opponents during the actual constitutional debate, or at least those arguments came from those uh, peop uh, men and then were, of course, supported by others and, and uh, argued for by others as well. Um, so four states right out the ga uh, gate uh, approve it, but they still need another five, uh, and that becomes the issue uh, with states like Massachusetts, um, like New York, uh, and, and others that are going to be um, considering it and will eventually pass it, but they require a little bit more explanation or at least a little bit more as far as guarantees go regarding uh, protecting certain elements of, um, of the lives of citizens and states so, and the, the, the states governments so um, that's gonna be the process and what we're gonna see here is opposition from uh, the camp of the anti-federalists from anti-federalists that's a name we've uh, heard before um, so one example of, uh, is um, uh, Patrick Henry. And not that he, as far as I know anyway, did any contributions to uh, writing, which we're going to talk about here in a second, but Samuel Adams is another famous anti-federalist. Um, we'll just refer to Patrick Henry, although there's going to be others that we're going to talk about here. The anti-federalists, if you remember from the Constitutional Convention, they actually um, initially opposed the uh, Constitution at all. Opposed... U.S. Constitution, fearing a stronger central government or national government, right? They wanted more power invest, invested into the states, and they were, generally speaking, ones that didn't want to change the government or form a new one. They wanted to uh, just revise the Articles of Confederation because they liked the amount of state power uh, that each state had. That they, they might have wanted to tweak it a bit, maybe add some national power, but they did not want a total redo uh, in favor of a much stronger central government, uh, at least in general. 
So that was what they were arguing for. But once the ratification debates uh, begin and, and get underway, and they've already approved this uh, constitution itself, and it's going out to the states uh, to debate, um, they're not going to necessarily oppose it, it being ratified, like outright opposing it and, and saying, no, we're, we refuse to change and move away from the articles. More so, they're going to say, we're not going to ratify it until you have some specific um, requirements added, protections specifically, because they feared a few things. So uh, that, that shift's going to be, um, uh, but they shift to a um, uh, request or, or requirement, probably is a better way of phrasing it. Shift to a requirement of amendment. Uh, and then again, these change and it's formal change added to the Constitution that either adds something, changes it, or takes it out. Uh, we've had 27 so far, and one of them was removing uh, a previous one. Um, but that's uh, what they're going to request right out the gate, uh, and that's what they'll get uh, ultimately after this debate takes place. So uh, here's the issues that they had, primary issues. This isn't all of them, but this is uh, at least the ones we're going to talk about, the easiest ones to talk about, and probably the most significant. So primary issues. Uh, were as such. So, number one, uh, the executive branch, specifically the president, uh, they were worried it would be turned into a, a tyrannical monarchy uh, like Britain and, and other uh, governments had had. All right, so president uh, feared tyrannical monarchy. And let's keep in mind, by the way, this is a novel uh, office. Or position. There's no presidents before this. Uh, there had pretty much only been kings, uh, queen, monarchs, basically, or uh, oligarchies, um, or direct democracies. And there have been some republics too, but never really had there been a president that, the, certainly not through the UC Electoral uh, College either, um, but never had there been a pre president that was elected uh, by the people and in a manner. Uh, such as used by the Electoral College with its uh, block voting for each state, like the majority winner of the state gets all the votes in that state. Nothing's, the Electoral College is brand new, but also this office of a president with its specific limitations and powers uh, is totally new. And they feared that this would just lead to another monarchy. Um, there's gonna fortunately be some uh, limitations in the Constitution that don't allow that. Uh, and there have been issues concerning executive power over the, the existence of the United States, but certainly nothing representing or, or mimicking what would, you would think of as, a, as an absolute monarch or even a tyrannical monarch. Uh, nonetheless, they're going to uh, be skeptical about this. Uh, so keep in mind, it's, it's a new idea, and they've, there have been elected monarchs in the past. Obviously, the president's not a monarch, but they were skeptical even of that because did this electing it process. They worried about there being one person with power and that they would just take it all themselves, abrogate it, um, and just eliminate any of anybody else that had any say, uh, certainly states. And uh, their examples previously were the Holy Roman Empire in Europe, uh, which had elected um, uh, a, a an emperor, and they'd done that through nine electors, uh, or I think it's nine electors. And uh, well, that sounds good, like, oh, they're electing and choosing their king, or their, their, uh, their emperor. What had traditionally happened, though, is they were just, they just voted for an emperor corruptly, meaning usually through bribery, they would, the people that became emperors had essentially bought uh, the position uh, or other favors, like, you know, vote me emperor and I'll give you this chunk of the kingdom or whatever as, you know, magistrate or duke or grand duke or whatever it might be. Um, and also the same thing that occurred in the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, where the nobles essentially elected the king, uh, and you had the same problem, whether it was uh, corruption through bribery or corruption through um, some sort of twisted political or economic favors afterwards. So there's a bad history of electing monarchs, uh, and they know that. So this is going to be an issue for them as far as one of their primary concerns goes, anyway. Uh, second one was uh, the issue was a, uh, an out-of-control judicial branch. And the reason why they feared this is in the past, like I mentioned before, the judicial branch had uh, kind of hooked up generally with the, the monarch, the executive branch, and just been kind of a pool, a pool, a tool or a pawn of that office because the king or queen or emperor had traditionally uh, established the justices uh, or judges and they were of course dependent upon the king uh, financially uh, for their position and power, maybe their estate, their money, whatever it might be. 
So they were always afraid to, of course, go against the opinion of the king. So if there was, those two were connected, you had that threat. Um, and they were worried that there wasn't a clear enough distinction as to, first of all, what this judicial branch could do, uh, and then the complaints they did have about it, um, specifically one of its powers where it can take any act of the executive branch or legislative branch uh, and void it if it's not constitutional. So they basically say, oh, here's a law passed by the legislature, or here's an action by the president or executive branch. Uh, if it doesn't, in their opinion, match up with the uh, constitution, then they can declare it void. Uh, so they were worried that that would be an out of control uh, set of powers, like it was too much power for one, one body. Uh, but there'll be some arguments against that. So they were uh, worried about this out of control judicial branch as far as uh, judicial review goes. That's what that is, by the way. The ability of the Supreme Court to take any action by the Congress, the President, uh, or any lower uh, uh, courts, or any state uh, issues or actions or laws, and they can look at them and, and say, nope, that's not constitutional, or yep, that is constitutional, and here's why, uh, and validate it or get rid of it. So a lot of people were afraid of that, but they were also worried about there weren't a lot of specific protections provided for people or states, like as an individual. So it wasn't clear what the uh, judicial branch had the authority to do uh, or what they couldn't do to individuals as far as like putting you on trial, putting you in prison, etc. cetera. Uh, so out of control judicial branch was, a, was an issue. So judicial review and uh, a lack of protections. And uh, lastly, again, this is not all of them, but uh, they also, of course, feared uh, a lack of general protections for, not just against the judicial branch, but just in general, protections for individuals and states. And they worried uh, that, again, the federal government, whether it was executive, judicial, or legislative branch, whoever it might be, that they were just going to abrogate the power from states, or they would... Uh, uh, persecute or discriminate against the uh, rights of individuals. So that was their primary set of complaints. And what we're going to have is a uh, long series of debates generally taking place um, not face to face but through periodicals, newspapers, pamphlets, things like that, um, where certain individuals are going to argue uh, in favor of these uh, policies and other individuals are going to argue not necessarily against them. Uh, but provide some explanation or defense of the Constitution as it was without, without changing. So that's going to be what defines these, uh, these coming months because this ratification process is going to take um, about mm, eight or nine months depending on when you technically put the start of it. Uh, so that's what we'll talk about next. So that is what the anti-federalist issues are going to be. Uh, Patrick Henry is a good example. He contributed some essays in this debate uh, or some writings in this debate before and after it that were, were used. So that is the anti-federalists, and the uh, response is going to come, of course, from the federalists. Uh, so the ratification debates, you could say, and again, a lot of these are just written through periodicals like newspapers and pamphlets and things like that. Ratification debate is going to take place, roughly speaking, uh, from October 1787 uh, to about June-ish. Uh, 1788. Not that they're going to stop writing or talking um, on a state level or an individual basis, but at that point, I believe that was when the ninth uh, state had ratified, uh, and they, they still, of course, were waiting for and hoping for all the states to do it, but at that point, uh, the Constitution was, was approved, ratified, and officially going to be the government of the states. So here's what's taking place. So I already laid out the anti-federalists. The response is going to be uh, from the federalists response from such a response to anti-federalists came from uh, the federalists and we've talked about them before as well so, but the details will be a little different here uh, the federalists are individuals who during the actual constitutional convention those debates uh, they were of course supporting a a national government, a stronger national government uh, in general. And um, they wanted to, uh, at this phase, try to defend the Constitution as it was and avoid changes, essentially. So that's going to be their kind of goal. And that's, by the way, their explicitly stated goal is they want people to ratify it and they don't think it needs to be changed. It, it, it's adequate the way that it is. Uh, and, and it's not just because they're lazy. They actually had some reasons for that. You would definitely not say they were lazy because they wrote 85 essays 
uh, between three people uh, it, over this period of time. Didn't make any money off of it. Um, in fact, they did it anonymous, anonymously. So I would not categorize that uh, uh, or characterize that as lazy. Nonetheless, they don't uh, want it to change initially. So uh, they are going to uh, write at least the three gentlemen we're going to talk about that probably had the most influence, certainly the most influence on our government as a whole. Um, whether or not they influenced the actual debate or the decision to ratify is, is somewhat unknown. But it certainly set a, a political, the tone of political theory uh, and philosophy of the United States going forward. So um, the response was, came in the form of the Federalist Papers, as they're known. And they were written in this time frame, roughly speaking. And uh, that's going to be 85 essays. Uh, that are most of them are going to be published um, through uh, uh, newspaper newspapers, I should say, in New York, because uh, that's what they were focusing on. That was one of the more uh, contentious states. Uh, so a lot of the publications are going to come out of New York. Uh, so as, if you ever read them, and you, most of you probably never will, but uh, uh, if you ever read them, they're titled most of them like to the people of New York or something along those lines. Uh, they were published outside of New York. So what I should say about this is. They were written mostly in New York, but some of them did extend outside of New York. The question becomes, how much did these papers influence this actual uh, ratification process? Uh, the answer is, well, we don't really know, first of all, but uh, it's kind of unlikely that they had a huge impact at the time. In fact, by the time New York ratified the Constitution, they were the 10th state. It was already uh, federal law at that point. So it was kind of irrelevant if uh, New York went one way or the other at that point. Um, but also, like I mentioned, there wasn't much publication outside of New York. There was some, but it was relatively limited in scope. Uh, but even if it didn't have that much impact on the ratification process, it absolutely did as far as um, setting legal precedents later on, which are basically Supreme Court cases where they, uh, or even acts of Congress, where they um, uh, make a decision, whether it's a court decision or make a law, based on past interpretations or intentions of the Constitution. So what this did was, uh, since these guys were primarily the ones that helped construct it, Madison's one of them, uh, they are going to be uh, uh, referred to many times throughout history when either justices of the Supreme Court or congressmen of the House or Senate are making laws or amendments or, or reviewing uh, things judicially. They're going to reference back to these because if it's unclear exactly what the wording of the Constitution means, what you can do is you can think, uh, well, okay, what did they mean by this? What was their intention? And these essays provide us uh, with an excellent set of insights as to what they meant by some of the more vague wordings in the Constitution. So things that you could interpret multiple ways, like uh, to help to promote the general welfare. It's like, what does that mean exactly? What is that? What, what sort of powers does that give the government to do? Uh, we can sort of infer those uh, from reading some of these Federalist Papers and others, or these uh, framers who draft the Constitution and approved it, uh, expanded on their arguments and, and, and uh, codified them in these Federalist Papers. So three of the primary writers here, or the three primary writers here, are uh, Alexander Hamilton, I'll put the last name, Hamilton, who uh, is believed wrote the most, most of them, uh, James Madison, uh, who probably wrote the most influential ones, um, and then there's John Jay, who um, wrote quite a few in the, in the beginning, but he became ill and I think he only wrote one more after that. So he wrote like four or five, the first ten, but then after he became ill, uh, he only wrote one. Did he only write one more? It was way less. I think it was just one more, but nonetheless, those are the three primary writers. And uh, again, Hamilton does write the most, but uh, most people consider Madison's to be the most, uh, uh, the ones that resonated most throughout um, uh, the United States. And uh, how can I frame this? How can I phrase this? Weighed heavily upon the conscience and uh, beliefs of, of other people. So um, as I describe these, these, these papers, we'll talk about a couple of them. I do have to qualify that I am a little bit biased towards Madison. Um, I do kind of admire him. I'm not, I'm not one that easily admires people, by the way. But hear me out on this. Uh, Madison did a wonderful job, and this is so rare to see in history, but in, just in general, but certainly in history. Uh, an individual who believes something, and first of all, eloquently puts forth his ideas and why he thinks they're the best. Uh, and he does a really good job of doing that, uh, explaining why he thinks this is the best uh, set of options. He also does a really good job, and this is also rare, of uh, 
explaining the alternatives. So he doesn't just say, this is the best and this is why. Uh, he says, here's the best, but here's the other options. And then he talks about why those aren't as good. Uh, but, and here's the real kicker, this is what really wins me over anyway, is the fact that Madison did those two things, laid it out well, and then uh, correctly or, or did it adequately or competently laid out a bunch of alternate measures. But he actually listened to the anti-federalists. He read their responses, um, even though there was only 16 or so really quality ones. Uh, he read their responses and remembered it going forward um, because he's going to take the things they said in their responses in this debate, and he's going to apply them uh, to the uh, first 10 amendments. He's proposed 12, only 10 won't make it. But that Bill of Rights was made because he, despite laying out his wonderful arguments, he's gonna actually listen to the other side and, and uh, realistically understand that either they require this to be satisfied, to have a, a, a country that's stable enough, uh, or he legitimately saw the points they were making and uh, incorporated them and, and compromised them and molded them into something that could make both sides adequately happy. That's really hard to find. Uh, a lot of people are, um, not, I'm not saying Hamilton was defined by this, but Hamilton was a lot more, this is what is right, and this is why I'm right. Um, but Madison went beyond that. He went, this is uh, why, this is what I believe, this is why I believe it, here are the uh, alternatives, but oh, I'll listen to you and actually genuinely consider some of the things you're saying and include them if they are, um, if they are not worthwhile, but, uh, uh, if they have value, I guess you could say. And again, I'm not saying Hamilton did it at all, but if you weigh the amount that each party did that, uh, he did it quite a bit more. And that's pretty rare. So they're 85. We're not going to talk about 85, but um, California, at least, wants us to talk about federal pace, Federalist Paper uh, 10 and 78, I think. Uh, but I'm going to include, maybe I have to. I don't remember if I have to or not. But I'm going to include Federalist Paper 51 as well, because that's one of the, if not the most influential one as far as uh, uh, laying out a good defense of the uh, uh, separation of powers and, and checks and balances system. So I'll try to go through quickly. Photos paper 10. So here's some examples of them. Oh, and again, uh, these are a series of essays uh, and the intent was to, uh, intent was to uh, convince states to ratify the constitution. As it was, um, and by the way, they didn't want to uh, not include these additions that anti-federalists were were suggesting. Not because again they were lazy. They again they wrote a bunch of essays uh, that nobody paid them for or knew about, uh, as far as if it was them or not. Um, they really didn't want to add a bunch of wording that made it things too complicated, because if they added a, a bunch of specific uh, things the government couldn't do, then the issue becomes well. Does that mean all other things they can do? So any other way they could abuse power, we didn't say they couldn't, so then they can do it. That would make it difficult. Uh, and they also, in the reverse, if you only list the things they can do, does that mean they can't do anything else? Uh, that becomes an issue. Uh, so the scope as to what they can and can't do. But also, uh, it makes it easier to misinterpret things. Uh, because if you can't be so specific that it applies to all things happening in 1787 and 88, as well as all things going forward up to even now, 2020, they can't even know what all the things are gonna be, uh, new technologies, new ideas, et cetera. Uh, so making a specific set of uh, uh, requirements uh, can actually be problematic. It can actually bind you uh, or cause people to misinterpret things uh, going forward. So that was kind of their objection. Anyways, sorry, Federal Tipper 10. That was written by Madison. And this one uh, does an excellent job of explaining why the way it was set up, the American Republic, and again, Republic is where you vote for representatives who go and, and make laws for you. Uh, it's not you voting all laws as a democracy, that's a direct democracy. Uh, it's a republic, but also as a constitution. So he's going to uh, uh, basically describe to people why very, very, very eloquently, uh, I might add. He doesn't describe people why um, it was adequately set up to best protect people against uh, tyranny, uh, not only of just the uh, federal government, but of, of voters. Um, and that was what his, I don't wanna say theory, but that was what his primary point was. Uh, he's essentially gonna say, and I'll, I'll detail it here, there are certain things human beings 
inevitably end up doing things that are immoral or, or not good. So we have to set up a system that best prevents those things uh, uh, or, or controls what it can and can't do. So Madison, here he's going to uh, uh, warn people about the, uh, the, the danger of factions. And when I say factions, uh, and he mentions the word parties too, but it's kind of like a political party, the way he words anyway. What he means by a faction is a group of people who have a common set of beliefs or a, or a common set of interests, uh, and they're going to work together to get what they want. And to them, whatever their goal is, right, uh, whatever they want, they're not going to pay attention to what's actually morally uh, just or right. Uh, and they're also not going to care about, or at least they're probably not going to care enough about other opinions. So, and you're like, well, who cares? If a few people want something and nobody agrees, then oh well. Yeah, well, what if that faction grows to the point that they're more than half of the people in the United States? So the other 49% of people, or even smaller amounts, even if it's only 5% of people in the United States that disagree with something, uh, that's still, especially today, if you look at the size of our country, that's still millions of people, potentially. Uh, so you can't just have one faction who has a lot of people in it just doing whatever they want and running roughshod over uh, the rights of individuals or minority parties. And I don't necessarily mean like racial minorities, although it could mean racial minorities. What I mean is like people that just have different views. Uh, so if let's say they believe that <clears throat> certain books are dangerous to read, um, they could try to ban books. You're like, oh, who cares about banning books? I don't even read anyway. Uh, well, that is essentially uh, limiting free speech. Uh, so a group that uh, maybe they're a religious group or maybe they're uh, an ideologically possessed group on the far right or the far left, um, trying to ban certain works by maybe on the far right by, by you know, groups that they hate, like uh, most far right wingers that are on the radical end uh, tend to hate certain ethnic minorities like uh, Jews and things like that. So they might ban works by uh, people from those groups or people on the far left might ban things from uh, people they see as um, uh, evil, whether they're, um, you know, what, whatever they might be, whether they're capitalists or imperialists or uh, patriarchs or whatever they think that they might be, they can outright ban things. Um, that would be violating the rights of a group of people no matter what, um, besides them. Uh, they wouldn't be able to uh, be stopped if they had enough people um, on their side, if that faction grew, whether it's far left, far right, or religious, or whatever it might be. Uh, if, they, if it grew too large, they could do whatever they want. They could just make laws and no one could stop them, and they could totally take away people's rights if they if they don't like them or they disagree with them, uh, and that, that could totally happen. So that's a legitimate fear. Uh, worry about uh, the danger of factions. This is also sometimes, sometimes referred to as the tyranny of the majority, which means if I got 51% of the votes, that 51% could do whatever they want, right? They can make whatever law they want, change whatever they want, uh, or, or you could say two, two thirds, right? Because that's what you need to, um, you know, propose amendments, or oh, even three quarters actually to ratify them. So if you had three quarters of people, you could do whatever you wanted. Uh, but uh, what they're gonna try to do, uh, and that's a bit scary to think about because they actually could still do that, but um, it's really hard to get 75% of all people to agree on anything. If it's 51% though, for example, which is easier to accomplish, they can do whatever they wanted. Uh, so Madison um, points out there's a couple ways to potentially stop this. And again, what they're trying to stop them from is uh, to protect rights of individuals uh, or minority views, which is a, which is a legitimate uh, threat if uh, there's no rules to, to bind them. So he's like, uh, there's two ways you could do it. You could uh, eliminate the uh, the cause, which is you know, the the formation of a faction. So you can either ban factions completely, or you can uh, make a faction that everyone agrees with. And he says both are impossible. Well, first one's not impossible, but the first one, if you ban them completely, then it's just violating people's rights and, and freedoms, uh, which is the whole point of setting up this government. So that's out. Uh, and if you you can't make everyone agree on all the same things, so that's an impossibility. All you can do, because you can't prevent this from happening, all you can do is limit what this group could do if it got swelled above 51% or even two-thirds. Uh, you limit what they can do with that, with that voting power or whatever they have. So not only do you separate the branches of the government so that um, 
the voters can't just control it, but um, you you bind them with a constitution. So there's there's two ways he says you can sort of limit what they can actually do. Uh, so the, the uh, solution is, and that's what he believes is done here in the Constitution, uh, what they've done in the Constitution, in the U.S. Constitution already, is, number one, have a large republic. So that way, even if uh, a couple of the large states get together and they try to dictate what's going on in the United States and they, they uh, make a bunch of changes um, and ignore you know, what smaller states want or smaller populations in those states want, the best way to stop them is the having a large republic. So now you've got a bunch of states that all have some say, uh, like in the Senate, for example, because they all have an equal say there. That could potentially stop this, uh, these large states, this large majority, uh, majority that's, that's forming a faction. Uh, it doesn't prevent it completely, but it makes it much harder to achieve. Um, so by having this republic where you send people to be representatives, uh, but you also send them from different states uh, that have um, the Senate and the House, so there's a state population and a fixed amount, that can make it much harder to achieve this. And lastly, uh, and this is the most easy one, you have a, a set of limits slash uh, protections for individuals or minority uh, groups. And that's going to be, of course, in the, and I don't have it up here, uh, in the U.S. Constitution, that's going to have uh, several specific uh, protections uh, implied in it, and they're, of course, going to add a layer of the Bill of Rights, too. But that was what his uh, point was, and uh, that one's going to resonate with, with quite a few people. So having a large, informed republic is going to be helpful. It's going to make it much harder for uh, one group to grow and swell and control others. Uh, but also having a set of protections and limits uh, that can uh, uh, prevent these groups from uh, even taking the rights of individuals uh, or groups. So that's going to be an important one going forward uh, as far as um, uh, shaping the opinion of um, members or citizens of the United States as well as uh, courts and Congress, etc., uh, going on through history. That's a big one. Next big one is also Madison. I'll just keep this where, where the way it is up here. Another big one by Madison is uh, Federalist Paper 51. So let's just keep a track here. Fed 10, 51, and 78 are the ones we're going to talk about. 51, also by Madison. Uh, this is the one where he's going to defend the system of what are called checks and balances. So he's going to say, first of all, it's going to be much harder for anyone to uh, take control of the government and take people's rights away and become a tyrant. First of all, because they're separate. So if we have a, a, a president and a legislature, uh, Congress and the Supreme Court, and they have no common interests, that's one of the best ways to um, uh, make sure nobody starts taking over. So uh, the issue, of course, is he's going to be talking, uh, he's going to defend the U.S. Constitution uh, um, U.S. Constitution's ability to prevent uh, tyranny in the government, I should say in the federal government, in federal government. So again, that means president, uh, Congress, or Supreme Court, the three branches. All right, so first of all, he's going to, of course, uh, lay out the, uh, support the uh, um, Montesquieu in ideas of separation of powers. So he's going to, of course, uh, endorse the separation of powers idea. And that's essentially this. If you have uh, each of those branches totally independent of one another, like uh, they don't depend on e each other for any particular uh, purpose, uh, and their goals are conflicting, they're different, they won't, they're much less likely to work together. And that's largely true. Um, it's true nowadays, you could definitely get a, a Congress that is in the House and in the Senate uh, majority one party, Republican, Republican or Democrat, and then a president that's also Republican or Democrat, uh, whatever the same one is with the other two. Uh, and they could just pass a bunch of legislation that um, maybe the other party doesn't like, whether it's Democrats or Republics, Republicans. Uh, but the uh, uh, Supreme Court in this case has no common goal or interest there. All they're trying to do is to decide if those laws or if the enforcement of the law is fair, according to the Constitution. If it's not, they can cut it down. Uh, and they've each got conflicting interests 
as far as that goes. Uh, and you're never going to have, in most cases anyway, a whole Congress that agrees with the president on everything. Uh, so as long as they have different interests, they're going to be constantly getting in each other's way uh, because they're not dependent on each other and they have different uh, goals and interests to carry out. So that's the first way uh, to make sure they're not working together. Uh, so like if you have like the old example of the kings that pick and pay for the, the justices, of course the judges are going to uh, act in the interest of the king because they're linked. Uh, but if you sever that link and they're not dependent on one another uh, and they have different goals and objectives, they're much less likely to work together. So that's a big one. But the second one is, uh, and this is the more important part in Federal Paper 51, he's going to um, support and sort of develop uh, the system of checks and balances. And this is an ingenious mechanism that the US uh, Constitution uh, framers, uh, Madison being one of them, uh, that drove this idea and, and, and helped install it. But not only should you separate the three branches, but just in case one of them is going off the wall as far as uh, violating the Constitution or, or, or doing things that they feel is unjust, there's a way that each branch can stop the other two, or at least make it much more difficult. So not only are they separate and have different interests, so they're not likely to work together, if one of the uh, groups, branches, is doing something that is, uh, doing something that is, how can I phrase this, tyrannical or it's unconstitutional, there's a way that the other two branches can stop them. So here's what I mean. Uh, let's get, uh, well, that's the main point, so I'm actually gonna erase this. Yeah, I'll actually just erase this part here, even though I didn't want to. So, we got our, our, our three branches. We've got the legislative branch, you've got the executive branch, you've got the judicial branch. So, separation of powers, keep their powers and interests separate. Uh, they're not dependent on one another, much less likely to work together. Check, done, got that, more or less. Next step, checks and balances. If the president is doing something that is, uh, I don't know, unconstitutional or tyrannical, there are ways, potentially, that the uh, legislative branch can either overcome what the president is doing, or the judicial branch can actually shoot down what the president's doing completely. So, the judicial branch can stop the executive branch if they're doing uh, something unconstitutional by using judicial review. And that's that process I described earlier, where they can look at an action of the president and actually say, oh, nope, that's not constitutional. Uh, uh, that has to be uh, undone or can't be done uh, or you have to answer for that by, by compensating or, or, or possibly being impeached, whatever it might be, uh, from office. All right. Uh, by the way, impeaching means try, put them on trial and then if they're found guilty uh, or they're convicted of the crime, then you can remove them from uh, office or ban them from political office, etc. But even then, it doesn't mean they're going to go to jail. Uh, they would have to be tried uh, with a, in a criminal court or a civil court afterwards. All the impeachment does is remove them and ban them from future political uh, positions. So that's that one. The legislative branch, too, can overcome uh, a veto, for example, by the president uh, with a two-thirds uh, override. So two-thirds of both houses of Congress um, agree and vote uh, to override a veto by the president. Like, let's say they, they're trying to control Congress by just vetoing all the laws they make. They can override that with two-thirds. So that is one way each branch can uh, stop or limit or inhibit the president. All right, so what about the legislative branch? What if they're doing stuff that's, that's out of control? Uh, the executive and the judicial branch can both hinder or stop them. So the president, we've already mentioned that, uh, he can veto or she can veto any bill uh, or, or law that they make. Um, it's not an absolute veto though, and that's an important feature uh, because if it were Absolute, it just, the veto just stayed. The president could just totally control the legislature. But if he has no veto, then the legislature could control, totally control the uh, uh, president. So they have a, a two-way thing where he can veto, uh, and then they can, but it's difficult to override that veto with a two-thirds uh, vote. Nonetheless, if they are um, doing something where, like, let's say the Democrats uh, have uh, the House and the Senate by 51%, and they're making a bunch of laws that are very upsetting or maybe even unconstitutional uh, to Republicans or others, uh, that would obviously mean half the nation's upset about it and potentially having their rights violated. Uh, the president could just veto that and then they, they wouldn't be able to do anything about it. But if it was something major that both parties came to agree on and, and, and it was a big issue and the president was trying to stop them, that's when they can 
they can undo it. So this is important because it can stop the majority from uh, ruling tyrannically or passing laws tyrannically, but uh, it also allows them to override the uh, present if there's a consensus or two-thirds majority. All right, the judicial branch can do the same thing, can do the executive to the legislative, and that's judicial review. And that is, again, they can take any law or action of the legislative branch and declare it unconstitutional uh, if it is unconstitutional. All right. And lastly, the two checks, yeah, the two checks that are on the judicial branch are going to be uh, similar uh, because they're going to be selected by uh, the president and then approved or appointed by the legislative. And I know you're like, wait a second, that means they're not separate, they're dependent on each other. They're not because the judicial branch uh, is relatively immune to being removed by uh, these groups. Now, if they are uh, doing something that is clearly a violation of the Constitution or corrupt, they can internally or through an impeachment process try somebody to remove them, but that is uh, an extreme measure. Um, for the most part, the uh, president's going to choose or, and then, or select them, and the legislative branch, specifically the Senate, by the way, is going to appoint the judges, justices of the Supreme Court. So, and the federal judges below them too. So that way, um, at least they have a say in who's going in there. They're not going to choose somebody who's corrupt. Obviously, they're going to look for somebody that has a, uh, a good history, of, a good legal history or judicial history, uh, and they're going to select them and approve them. Uh, and then when they get there, they're actually not dependent on these guys to keep that spot. They can actually keep it as long as they maintain good behavior. So they can keep it for life, uh, so long as they're uh, acting according to uh, their constitutional uh, requirements. All right, so they are um, good behavior. So they can serve for life, or they can retire when they want, or, or, or whatever. Um, but uh, they can't be removed um, arbitrarily or, or, or at will by the executive legislative branch. So that's what we call the systems of checks and balances uh, here, checks and balances in the United States. And again, that doesn't refer to like you know a checking account and balancing it out with debit and credit. We're talking about like balancing power by putting checks in uh, so that these uh, branches can all check or stop. Um, the actions of another if it's, if it's going out of control. So that's two mechanisms, of course, that are going to uh, um, allow our Constitution to limit or reduce the ability of the government to become tyrannical. And that's quite important uh, to the framers. So uh, that's what those two um, theories are stated and uh, argued thoroughly uh, in Federalist Paper 51. All right, last one. Federalist Paper 78. That one is going to be written by Hamilton. I'll try to go quicker on this one. I know I was going a bit slow on those, or a little bit too in-depth maybe. But oh well, better to know a bit more than you do than not enough. First paper for 78, that one's gonna do, have to do with uh, judicial review. Um, so that's going to be uh, an argument in favor of judicial review. Uh, slash the way it's set up in the Constitution. Some people are going to argue, anti-federalists uh, in particular, are going to argue that uh, it's a bad idea the way it's set up. Because if the courts have judicial review, that gives them like unlimited power uh, in the United States. And uh, Hamilton's going to point out at least two ways or reasons why that's not necessarily true and that it's set up as well as it can be. The first one is going to be uh, that good hate behavior clause, that they can only maintain office uh, via good behavior. Uh, but also, this is, this is related, they are disconnected from the executive and legislative branch. So those, those kind of go together, and I actually kind of described this a bit in the checks and balances portion, and Hamilton, credit him for describing this uh, most astutely, is, first of all, um, we can get rid of them if they are acting unconstitutionally or corruptly. Uh, and because they have this good behavior uh, term, which could be lifelong, uh, they're not dependent on these executive or legislative branches uh, for pay or for maintaining their power. And there's nothing in their interest uh, if they uh, go along with the president or the legislative uh, branch Congress just because uh, uh, they, they, they like them, because they're not dependent upon them. They might agree with something, but uh, that is not going to influence uh, 
uh, their behavior because there's no, they have nothing at stake. Uh, they're going to stay a judge so as long as they're performing their constitutional duties. Um, so they might pass things that these guys don't like, but unless it's unconstitutional and they're acting corruptly, taking bribes or something like that, uh, then they're uh, going to be able to do it and there's nothing to stop it. And the second one, and this has to do more with the, so with the judicial review, um, he's going to argue that the uh, justices of the Supreme Court and the federal judges below them. We'll talk more about that when we talk about the judicial branch, but we're, we're, we'll talk specifically about the Supreme Court. Yeah, in fact, I'll just say that. Justice of the Supreme Court, which now there's nine, there's, it's, it's varied from four or five all the way up to like 12, and it's rested at nine for quite a while now. Justice of the Supreme Court, which is the highest court in the land, people were worried that, again, they could just rule an iron fist because they could just shut down anything the legislative or executive branch does uh, according to judicial review. So the Justice Supreme Court are not um, uh, the highest authority or even the most powerful. Uh, because they are limited by the U.S. Constitution. He actually argues that they have the least amount of power because there's nothing they can do to affect change. For example, uh, the legislative branch can make laws, uh, the executive branch can enforce those or pass executive orders, uh, which can actually change things and do things. The courts can't. All they can do is undo things or they could uh, uh, react to things that are already happening. Uh, there's nothing, they, they can't like make their own laws, they can't control things. Um, you could say, all right, they, they, uh, they went and removed things that made our lives worse uh, or took our rights away, but um, it's hard to do that because they're limited by what the U.S. Constitution says. They don't get to make up, essentially, um, their decisions. If their decisions don't line up logically, and coherently with what the U.S. Constitution uh, intended or says, then uh, they're not doing their job. And that's when you could ax them for uh, not abiding by the good behavior. Uh, again, if they're taking bribes or not applying the Constitution to their decisions, uh, that's when you would remove them. Um, so that exists uh, as, a, a, as a check in itself. Uh, and he also says they're not like the, the masters or overlords of the government. They're actually servants uh, of the, the master, which would be the U.S. Constitution. So. They're very much limited to what they can do. They can't affect change much on their own, and they're very limited uh, explicitly to what uh, the decisions they can make. It has to be based specifically on the U.S. Constitution uh, as far as when they're judicially reviewing things. So he argues, again, uh, they can be removed, and they have no incentive to uh, behave uh, or, or cooperate with these branches. Uh, and also that um, they're very limited in what they can do uh, as far as uh, it has to align with the Constitution. Otherwise, uh, out they go for not abiding by that. Uh, so again, point was, they won't be the masters or overlords of the government, they're the servants of it uh, because they can only do what is uh, provided to them uh, or they interpret according to the U.S. Constitution. And he makes some excellent points. Uh, and it's enough to win over <coughs> uh, people going forward and, uh, and it really sets the precedent for um, the, uh, what the, the judicial branch is gonna do going forward um, in the early years of the uh, U.S. and going all the way up to the 1960s and 70s uh, through the Civil Rights Movement, too. All right, <clears throat> so like I mentioned before, it's unclear how much impact this had on the ratification process itself, but these papers are profoundly influential on how we view and apply uh, the U.S. Constitution and, 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 and run the United States going forward. So um, what these debates do accomplish is uh, debates result in a compromise. <clears throat> the compromise is this. Federalists agree to immediately, it takes three years to draft these and ratify them, but to immediately apply specific changes, mostly protections of individuals and states, uh, if ratified. Uh, and they honor that agreement, by the way. So as soon as uh, um, the states ratify the Constitution and it becomes the enforcing legal government of the United States, uh, what happens uh, pretty much immediately is James Madison, uh, again, looks at the arguments put forward by the Anti-Federalists 
and drafts 12 amendments right off the bat that Congress, um, as they're voted in, they uh, are going to, of course, uh, look at these 12 amendments uh, and um, uh, propose actually 10 of them, uh, and that those, of course, are going to be um, uh, passed, ratified by three quarters of the states. Uh, two of them don't get ratified, though. Uh, Ten of them do, and that's known as the uh, Bill of Rights. So that's going to um, uh, result in the uh, Bill of Rights, which again is just another word for the uh, another a phrase or a, the name of the document, the name of the first ten amendments. Um, and what's going to be weird is <clears throat> these are going to uh, arguably more so determine the uh, laws and legal decisions for the Supreme Court uh, than the actual Constitution itself is going to be. There's going to be plenty of issues about the, the wording specifically in the U.S. Constitution uh, and, and roles and things the government uh, and the executive and legislative branch can and can't do. But this Bill of Rights is going to act as probably the most important mechanism uh, which we applied and expanded uh, individual rights uh, to everybody, including uh, non-property owning white males, and then to uh, minority groups, uh, and then to women. And then finally, uh, in the 60s, uh, made sure that individual states couldn't uh, prevent people from exercising their freedoms uh, economically or through voting processes by, with, with poll tax and things like that. Uh, so it took a long time. But keep in mind, this is the first time in the world that um, people are, the government is opening this up to, uh, to uh, such a wide range of people. So they're non-nobles. And, and, and of course, at the beginning, when it's overwhelmingly uh, property wide owning males that uh, acquire these freedoms uh, and abilities and privileges, uh, that's revolutionary at the time. Nobody else had that. It was uh, very much uh, caste or social class oriented. Uh, based on birth, you know, nobility and monarchs and other elites uh, or, or religious elites basically ruled. Uh, and if you were in up in those classes, in the peasant classes or slave classes, uh, you had no rights whatsoever. And of course, we do still have slavery here in the U.S. up until uh, uh, the Civil War. But this was revolutionary at the time. And thanks to this Bill of Rights, over the next few decades, uh, less than 200 years, but 150 or so years, up to about 180 years, um, we're going to event gradually add protections that include uh, non-whites. Uh, well, first of all, include property-owning whites, males, and then, uh, then extend to uh, non-whites, uh, still with males. And then they extend voting rights to women. And then in the 60s and 70s, they extend full protections, even in states, uh, to uh, all minority groups uh, and women as well. So it's a long process. Um, that's just a short process if you look at human history, but it's a long process, multi-generation, but <clears throat> this Bill of Rights was absolutely uh, influential in establishing that, uh, as well as the other amendments we add to later, like the 14th Amendment, for example, which we'll, which we'll get to um, in a couple of weeks. So Bill of Rights being added, that was a major, major, major development uh, and a result of these anti-federalists. Uh, some of the stuff they didn't get what they wanted, but they got these uh, Bill of Rights. <clears throat> and again, that's going to be a lot, a host of individual and states' rights protections. And a lot of them are going to focus on the uh, judicial branch. But that is one we'll talk about on the uh, next uh, lecture. So that's that.